proceed to Karim Fahed, who will, I think, of course, maybe, uh, talk about uh, Pseudomogoplistus vigente, uh, the populations in the UK. He is monitoring for several years now, so I suppose there's some news. Karim, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, and we can see your presentation. Great. Even better. First of all, I'd like to say I'm sorry I can't be with you all. It's always one of my favorite conferences, so uh, <laughs> greetings, fellow orthopterists. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about our monitoring of the Atlantic beach cricket. Um, can you see the next slide okay? So this is yes, an Atlantic beach cricket. Yes, we can, we can see it, sorry. On, excellent. This is an Atlantic beach cricket on Chesil Beach showing the highly unusual habitat of this cricket. So it lives very close to the sea um, on shingle beaches and under stones. Um, it appears to be omnivorous, feeding on the strand line. So it's a very unusual habitat, very specialist. Um, it's flightless and nocturnal, so very low dispersal capacity, apparently. Um, we found that it has a two year life cycle, um, eggs to adult. So it overwinters both as eggs and as mid-stage nymphs and some adults even overwinter. It occurs essentially along the Atlantic coast of Europe from uh, the nor most northerly population is the one in Wales, in Pembrokeshire, uh, right down to the coast of Morocco. Um, so this um, image is taken from Pelizuelo 2021, and basically the black circles show the distribution of Pseudomogoplistis vicenti. Um, the other dots are other members of the same genus, and it also shows a new population in the Basque country that Pelizuelo found. The species is classified as vulnerable on the IUCN red list and potential threats that are listed include an increase in the severity and frequency of severe storms with climate change. One particularly severe storm which was described as a one in a hundred year event occurred in the winter of 2013-40 and you can see here almost a tsunami like wave which is about to hit Chesil Beach which is one of the main populations. The severe Atlantic storm affected all three of the UK's populations. So here you can see um, the Welsh coast during the severe storm. Also significantly on the right, those beach chalets used to rest on shingle. Now shingle is the habitat of the uh, Atlantic beach cricket in Branscombe, Devon, which is where that photograph was taken. You can see that about nine feet of the shingle was removed by the storm. So this prompted me to want to monitor the Atlantic beach cricket, in particular, find records from before the severe storm, uh, compare them with the population levels and the distribution along the beach afterwards. So our aims were to establish a monitoring protocol for the species in the UK, to get baseline data to continue monitoring the three main uh, UK populations, and crucially to compare the size and relative extent of the population um, following the storm surges of the winter 2013-14. First of all, we looked at bait preference. Uh, we set out nine traps. Now the traps are just plastic pint uh, glasses, um, baited in this case, with a variety of baits. We wanted to compare um, seven different baits um, including dry cat food, wet cat food, um, boarfish, mealworms, seaweed, uh, and a control with no bait. We then conducted monitoring, and again using the pitfall traps, and you can see a particularly successful pitfall trap at the bottom. Um, so in summer 2016 and 2019, all three sites in the UK, Chesil Beach, uh, which is in Dorset, Branscombe, which is in Devon, and Marlowe's, which is in Pembrokeshire in Wales, were surveyed, um, with additional surveys in 2020 and 2021 for two sites. As you'll see in a minute, we used dry cat biscuits, which were left overnight. Uh, we also used hand searches at Marlowe's Sands. The pitfall traps were placed at the same grid references using a GPS device, as previous surveys. And what was fortuitous is there had happened to be um, 
surveys at each of the sites before the severe storm surge of 2013-14. And this just shows some of the pitfall trap locations. Um, so there was 33 traps at Branscombe. Here are the locations at Marlow Sands. Uh, here are the hand search locations at Marlow Sands, which were more or less similar to the pitfall trap locations. At Chesil Beach, we replicated Timmins 1996 study using pitfall traps, but because his traps were somewhat randomly uh, aligned along the beach, we set up new, also set up new monitoring points which were more regularly um, uh, distributed along the beach for ongoing monitoring. So moving on to the results, bait preference. This is the median catch per trap um, and here you have the different baits. So as you can see, um, fish, dry cat food, mealworms, and wet cat food were the most, had the greatest catch, and all of these were significantly different from the no bait control. There was no significant difference in the catch between fish and dry cat food, so that means we recommend the use of dry cat food, which in this case was go cat, um, herring with tuna, although other brands are available, um, this worked most effectively. And of course, it's very light, very portable, very easy to use for baiting pitfall traps. Moving on to the results from Branscombe, these are the results for 2010. And what you see is the number of crickets per trap um, against the trap number, which move from west to east along the beach. 2010 was before the storm, as you can see, after the storm, the numbers have been significantly lower. So if you just compare the median catch uh, before the storm with afterwards, there's a significant difference, but there's not really any significant difference. There's no significant difference between the different sampling years. So it seems that there has been an effect on the population and the recovery is slow. Moving on to the pitfall trap catches from Marlow Sands, it, this is the number trapped against the trap number, again moving from west to east along the beach. The red is the pre-storm survey and the yellow is 2016 and the green is 2019. Now although there's no significant difference in the median trap per catch between the years, you can see a clear difference in the range of the cricket along the beach. Um, the 2016 and 2019 population is much more concentrated to the western part of the beach and has more or less disappeared from the eastern part of the beach. We get the same pattern when we look at the hand search results. So in red we have the pre-storm, um, then in yellow 2016, green 2019, purple 2020. And again you can see this trend of the population potentially increasing but being very much restricted to the western part of the beach. When you look at the situation on the field, it's absolutely clear why. The image on the left hand side shows um, exactly the same view of the uh, one of the sampling locations. First of all in 2006, which was before the severe storm, and then in 2016. And what you can see is that the shingle habitat has more or less completely disappeared, um, being scoured away by the storm. Moving on to Chesil Beach, um, the first image here shows the number of trap per pitfall trap against the trap number. And this is comparing Timmins uh, 1996 study with um, where we replicated the position of his pitfall traps in 2016. Uh, Timmins results from 1996 are in blue and the 2016 results are in red. And as you can see, there appears to have been quite a significant decline um, in the number of, of crickets per trap and a decline especially in the middle. Now interestingly this is an area where Chesil Beach was actually breached by the tsunami-like wave. Incidentally Chesil Beach has only been breached once in living memory uh, and that was by that severe storm. Moving on to the new monitoring points, this is comparing the new monitoring points along Chesil Beach in 2016 with 2019. And the good news is there seems to have been an increase. So the 2016 results are in orange and the 29 results are in yellowy orange. <laughs> um, so you can see that the numbers have appeared to have increased. So 
it looks like there could be some sort of recovery of the Chesil Beach population. So to conclude, at Marlow Sands and at Branscombe, the range of the core population of scaly crickets along the beach appears to have contracted. There's evident loss of shingle at Marlow Sands. The population at Marlow Sands has increased in the western part, but has disappeared from most of the site. The population at Branscombe appears to have decreased, and this seems to be associated with a resorting of the shingle to uh, perhaps a smaller shingle size by the storm. At Chesil, um, there was an initial decline after the uh, storm, but there is a sign of recovery of the Chesil Beach population. And finally, recommendations, uh, covered pitfall traps, um, baited with fish flavor, dry cat biscuits are a good way of monitoring the species. At Marlow's, hand searches are also suitable. It's only really suitable for that site because you have larger pieces of stone in quite a shallow stone layer with sand underneath, so you can turn them over more effectively. At the other sites, the shingle is too deep to allow hand searching. At Chesil Beach, we recommend using the new monitoring points that we established, which are more evenly spread along the beach. Given the habitat loss at Marlow's and the apparent decline at Branscombe, we recommend that monitoring at all three populations should ideally continue. A final thought is that the species is clearly very adapted to survive. One thing I found in my 2020 study of the life cycle was that females lay eggs in driftwood and that these eggs take a year to develop, showing no embryonic development over the winter. There's therefore the potential for the species to actually raft to new locations or to su survive inundation by the eggs uh, being uh, surviving within a driftwood environment. Interestingly, some new populations have been discovered. It may be that the species was under-recorded before. It could equally be that via this rafting method, the species may even be expanding. And finally, uh, thank you very much to a range of people, uh, including Natural England, the National Trust, um, Alex Hyde for his macro photography, and to Gabriel Varhead, my son, for, and my partner, Kate Bellis, for field assistance. Thank you very much. Really great to see such a long-term monitoring scheme for producing a lot of, uh, well, still, still interesting records. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, there are. Klaus Jürgen Konze from Germany, many thanks for this talk. Um, is there any evidence that these severe storms also lead to new suitable habitats? And uh, do you think it is possible that the species could reach it? Yeah, that's a very good question, because on the one hand, the severe storms can remove huge areas of shingle. But the ironic thing is that the um, areas of shingle are also deposited by storms. So yes, the, the storms could in fact create new habitats. And I think that by rafting, eggs rafting in driftwood, it's a bit of a random hit and miss method, but it's quite possible that they could colonize new areas. So for example, just last year, a new population in, in the UK between the um, Branscombe um, Devon site and the Chesil Beach Dorset site, which are two adjacent counties, a new population immediately between them was uh, just discovered last year. So it is quite possible that new habitat is being um, created and that rafting of eggs in driftwood could be a method of dispersal. It's hard to think of any other method of dispersal in this small flightless cricket, which is very good at drowning. Hi, Karim. Uh, Armin Landmann speaking here from Austria. Uh, nice to Hi, see you again. <laughs> nice to see you again, too. I'm sorry we Just one question. Uh, haven't there been some minor storms in between, and did they influence the, um, uh, the abundance of, 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 the, of the cricket? Absolutely. I mean, part of the, the problem with climate change is that these Atlantic storms are becoming much more frequent. Um, so yes, while I was most interested in the effect of the, the storm of 2013, which was described as a once in a hundred year event, I'm not convinced it is any longer a once in a hundred year event. In fact, only last year, uh, only earlier this year, there were 
uh, severe storm warning, so much so that um, public transport was stopped for the whole of Wales. And that again, there was tsunami-like waves hitting the beach. So in reality, the populations are constantly being buffeted by these severe storms, which seem to be becoming more frequent in, in occurrence. Um, so yes, I, I, it, it's hard to pin down the changes in the population levels to just one storm when they're a repeated event. So thank you very much again. Karim, great to have you here. Thank you very much.